Good afternoon. I'm Nairi Woods, Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government here at the University of Oxford. And a big welcome to all of you for joining us in the room and online for this discussion about resetting democracy. We're delighted here at the University of Oxford to have with us Professor Hélène Landemort, who's joining our, our faculty and is leading in a really bold, audacious set of, of thoughts about how we can rethink democracy in the 21st century. That's important to all of us because almost every single one of us is living in a democracy which is suffering huge problems. Democracy looks as though it's fraying, splintering, eroding in so many countries around the world. And we see that every day here in the Blavatnik School of Government. In, in, in almost every one of your countries, democracy is facing some kind of crisis. We're very lucky today also to be joined by Nazir Razak, who spent a year here at the Blavatnik School of Government studying the issue of democracy and how you can reset democracy as a transformational leadership fellow, who's known to many of you much more for his business leadership, leading CIMB, the Malaysian bank, to being one of ASEAN's most important banks, now heading Malaysia's development banks um, for you know, Malaysia's developmental future. But today, it's the part of Nazir that's been thinking about workshopping um, what it is that, that a future positive democracy might look like in Malaysia. So Nazir, I'm gonna to turn to you first to tell us a little bit about what's the problem that democracy faces and what does that look like in Malaysia? What's the problem, as it were, that we're all trying to solve here? Nazir Thank Razak. You. Thank you, Nairi, and uh, uh, good evening, uh, everyone from, from KL. Uh, let me first of all just mention that today is uh, the Chinese, Chinese New Year as well. So uh, to those who celebrate, uh, let me wish you a happy new year. Now, the, the, my, the background to my um, interest in this topic uh, is that in 20, uh, back in 2015, I first advocated uh, the idea of a national reset. Uh, and I argued then that this should begin with the establishment of a deliberative uh, council or platform, uh, quite similar to the deliberative platform that was set up in 1970. Uh, in Malaysia that we call the National Consultative Council uh, and that had 67 people uh, and was set up after uh, the race riots and the declaration of emergency rule. Um, two things have happened uh, since 2015. One is that the situation in Malaysia has continued to deteriorate. Um, we had the um, uh, 1MDB debacle that I think epitomized the depth of corruption uh, in the system. Uh, two is uh, yeah, the economy uh, continues to be subpar. Uh, three is I think the there continues to be hardening of identity uh, politics. Uh, four, uh, various attempts at reforms in the system uh, have met with uh, fierce resistance uh, from vested interests. So the system uh, which was designed uh, in 1970, as I said, uh, continues uh, to be uh, in place and I argue is now dysfunctional. Uh, and this dysfunctionality has gotten worse uh, since um, uh, 2018 when the um, dominant gov party government of Barisan Nasional fell for the first time in 61 years and since then uh, we've had three uh, unstable coalitions uh, governing the country. So the other thing that's happened since uh, 2015 is, of course, the growing popularity uh, of uh, the liberative platforms uh, across the world. Uh, so it kind of synced uh, with what I was uh, advocating uh, for Malaysia. Uh, as you're saying, Ari, there's been this growing frustration uh, with representative uh, democracy. I think clearly, um, many of the current um, top of mind frustrations with uh, inequality uh, and inability to deal with climate change and so on uh, have been blamed uh, on the shortcomings of uh, the democratic uh, systems. Uh, and when I think about it, um, democracy is actually quite poor uh, at dealing uh, with long-term uh, structural issues, um, principally because of the heavy 
reliance on political parties uh, and politicians uh, with naturally uh, short-term views. And I think clearly the data also shows that deliberative platforms uh, have been very effective. I think since 1979, there have been something like 574 deliberative platforms across the world. Uh, and the data I looked at said that 76% uh, of those um, had uh, more than 50% of their recommendations actually uh, implemented. And that's a pretty good score. Uh, and clearly it's, you know, uh, enhances democracy because it kind of is more inclusive in terms of people involved in policy making uh, and uh, national issues. Uh, and it's also uh, compelling because the lifted democracy arrives at solutions or recommendations after deliberations, uh, which generally feature reflections, compromise, collaboration, uh, between uh, participants uh, instead of partisanship uh, and electioneering, which you tend to get in parliament. So decisions are based on reason, uh, not political or uh, economic might. Now, the citizen assembly uh, that we talk about here and um, the, the National Consultative Council of 1970 are actually uh, both uh, deliberative platforms, but quite different uh, in terms of membership uh, establishment processes and implementation uh, capabilities. I mean, you know, when you have a deliberative platform uh, with a, 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 within a dictatorship, uh, it's much easier uh, to have things uh, implemented. So uh, to me, uh, the, that all NCC model is no longer suitable uh, for my country uh, for, for uh, in today's conditions. Uh, I think we need to look at uh, the citizens assemblies uh, that have proliferated uh, across the world. Um, and my last point is that in uh, um, October uh, this year, I wrote to uh, His Majesty the King uh, of Malaysia to, uh, together with 54 other people to suggest uh, the establishment of a uh, citizens assembly. Uh, I called it the Better Malaysia uh, Assembly uh, to deliberate uh, the fundamental issues uh, towards uh, reform uh, and the building of uh, a better Malaysia. Uh, and of course, you know, it'll be fascinating um, uh, for me and, and for many of the listeners, I think, I believe, uh, to hear more uh, about, um, you know, from Helen in particular, uh, in terms of the experiences of other countries in the, the democracy and, uh, uh, of course, uh, her other uh, analysis uh, around the various issues uh, at establishing uh, these platforms. Well, thank you, Nazir. So the first part of your comments were really describing as I said at the outset, some of the malaise besetting all democracies in the world, Ellen, you know, democracies that are corrupted by special interests, that are divisive because politicians are using identity politics, and that are short termist by nature because it's running from each one election to another. Um, how do we solve that? How do we solve that? Um, well, first of all, um, happy Chinese New Year, everyone. I and to think that in order to solve that, you really need to have a precise understanding of the problem. And my diagnosis of the problem is that we can blame money in politics, we can blame globalization, we can blame technological change. All of these factors have played a role. But for me, a key problem is in the design of representative democracy as we reinvented it in the 18th century. And the design flaw that I see is that the way we select our democratic representatives, and in particular, people who make the laws for us on our behalf, in our name, uh, it's too oligarchic. We choose them through the mechanism of periodic elections. It's widely seen as like a, 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 you know, a, a feature of the democracy. But in fact, you know, ancient Greeks thought it was an oligarchic selection mechanism. And in theory and in practice, it's bound to select um, you know, uh, a relatively uh, homogeneous group of socio-political elites. And it's not all bad, it, you know, that, that's done some good over the last 200 years, but I think we're reaching the limits of, of that system because we are not including enough voices in the way we make policies, make laws, and we leave out too many people um, and, and we're paying the price. That's why you get the Yellow Vest in France, the, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. demonstrations in Chile that led to a you know, constitutional change, revolution in Iceland that almost led to a constitutional change. I mean, it's everywhere. People are fed up. The system is not delivering, and not just because of external reasons, because internal problems that I think we have yet to confront people. 
And, and a solution then, if we agree on that diagnostic, is to consider alternative selection mechanisms like random selection. And um, when Nazir mentioned these platforms and these citizens' assemblies, it's crucial to say that um, you know, uh, the ones I have in mind at least are based on random selection, not self-selection, not election, not appointment, because only through random selection do you truly tap the full diversity of profiles, um, you know, uh, ethnicities, uh, you know, uh, experiences, life experiences of, of a given population. So I think for me that's, I mean, it's not the solution, but it's definitely part of the solution, of, of the many solutions we need to bring to together. So tell us how the random selection works. A lot of people would say, sorry. Oh, your microphone. Oh. You put it on your, the lapel of your jacket. Uh, Sorry, go. Higher? Yeah. Can yeah. you hear me now? On this jacket. I'm so sorry. There <laughs> we um, go. So, is it better now? No, it did not. Okay. Well, it's supposed to be on, so I'm not sure. Can we, can we fix the microphone, Ellen's microphone? Thank you. Um, so a lot of people would say, oh, really, you're going to go and grab you know, every fourth person on the street and invite them to make laws for the country. Some of us might then think, oh, actually, if I look at the politicians we've got, that might be better. Um, but how would that work? How, when you say random selection, explain what random yes. selection would mean. So the Greeks had a very, uh, you know, uh, functional system where they had a so-called clerotarian, a machine where you put your token in it and then it, you know, somehow decided whether you got a, you know, a stone that indicated you were going to be part of the popular jury or not. Sorry, Ellen, we're going to hear more about how the Greeks actually did this. Well, we think about Can how you hear me now? I'm so sorry. Us. Okay, great. So the microphone was the problem, not me. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Okay, so, so the Greeks had a system where they were able to um, allocate positions of power of political offices randomly. Everybody put a little token in a machine called the Clarotarian, and then they knew whether they were assigned or not that day to a particular popular jury, to the Council of 500, which set the agenda for the, for the, for the you know, um, city of Athens. I mean, it worked. Now we have other methods. They are based on you know, advanced statistical techniques, so in the context of the French Citizens Convention for Climate, for example, which uh, convinced a, a sample of 150 people, what they did is that they generated random uh, phone numbers, around 300,000 of them, and then uh, they called those people, and then they constituted uh, you know, demographic groups, age, gender, socioeconomic categories, et cetera, education level, geographic origins, and then they sort of made a, um, a a sample of, a, of 150 people that tracked all the relevant dimensions of the you know, larger French public so that you, you, in the end, had a sort of mini portrait of France in that sample. The larger your sample, the better. You track more dimensions. Uh, I think it's ideal if you have a sample of you know, over 300, 400, 500. But even with a 150, you can get a decent sort of a representation of the various faces of French people. Just or tell any, us any people. And, and, and tell us about the difference between getting a randomly selected group of people to deliberate and decide about an issue and ruling by referendum, for example, where you're consulting all the people. Right. Well, so there's a trade off, right? With a referenda, you get a lot more participation, but you don't get the deliberation. So I think where Nazir and I agree is that you, know, you need reasons and thoughtful exchange of views and information to produce legitimacy. If you only aggregate top of the head sort of opinions, it doesn't necessarily lead to a terribly legitimate or, or even good outcome. Um, so the key in a, in a functional democracy is to combine those two methods. I don't see them as alternatives. It's not like, oh, referenda are all bad and only deliberative citizens' assemblies are good. But I think if we are going to produce laws and policies, it's not going to be through the mechanism of a referendum, right? The referendum comes uh, at the end of the process to validate it or perhaps to repel it. It could be a sort of recall system where the people, you know, decide that a law is not working for them and then they, they vote en masse to, re to, to sort of like uh, repel it. 
But so I think it's neither, it doesn't, you don't have to choose between aggregation and deliberation. You just have to find a way to articulate those two things because they're both essential to democracy. I really like the way in your work you draw our attention to how the jury system works in common law systems. Because there we've got a randomly selected group of people who deliberate. And, and I think your point is that if they know that their decisions are going to really have effect, they do it very seriously. Is that, is that right? How important is it that they know that their decisions are going to be the ones that decide whether you go to prison or not? I think long term, it really matters. Um, so far, the many cases of um, deliberative assemblies that have been tried have not had decisive power. Um, I mean, very few have, but they've had influence on the process, and that has been enough to really motivate the citizens. Um, but th when they're not taken seriously, you risk a backlash, right? In the French case, for example, at one point they felt like they had proposed this, you know, radical and, and you know, informed proposal to curb climate um, change in France in the spirit of social justice, and then the government proceeded to dilute a lot of the recommendations. And that generates anger and frustrations because you feel like what you did was participate in a, in a um, uh, you know, it's called participation washing, ex you know, experiment where you pretend to consult people and take them seriously, but you just do that to basically buy social peace. So it's really important that at some point we institutionalize those, those bodies and treat them as political actors in their own right. So in my, in my sort of work, I tend to imagine a radical version of an open democracy where we replace elected officials with uh, randomly selected uh, you know, bodies. But of course, more realistically, what, what we could do is hybridize and figure out um, a space where randomly selected bodies would be able to you know, play a role in complement to existing elected chambers rather than in replacement of, of them. Last question. I'm going to come back to Nazir to find out what this would look like. Would this be possible even in Malaysia? And then come to the audience for your questions and suggestions and, and, and reflections. But just last point on the deliberation. You know, we're living in a social media age where people do, you could say, deliberate with each other. But what we see is a kind of venting of anger and rage and aggression and you know, on Twitter, on Instagram, wherever it is. So what are the necessary parts of a deliberative process? And do they calm people down? Like, do they, once they're in that process, does it become less a venting of their identity politics and more a deliberation about the issue in front of them? Yes, what we observe in these processes is that uh, it tends to depolarize people and bring them together in, in really surprising, surprisingly effective ways. I think it comes from the fact that when they're chosen, it's not on the basis of their partisan affiliation, on the basis of you know, how rich or poor they are. It's, it's really on the basis of they're a citizen and they're an equal member of a society. And on that basis alone, they get a chance to participate. So when they come in, they they are not wedded to a particular position. They are open-minded, at, at least at the beginning of the process. And I think it diffuses a lot of the anger. Whereas in parliaments, people come in as party representatives. They're already wedded to views. They're already, you know, grandstanding, posturing. They, they, it's harder to change your mind. Um, and uh, people in, in social media and, and on, on the internet tend to sort themselves out um, on the basis of what they think and who they agree with. So it reinforces the sense of polarization. In these randomly selected assemblies, you create this sort of magic where, you know, a baker will talk to a banker and a, and a, and a cleaning lady will talk to, a, you know, um, a retired pilot. And you, you get this conversation that never happened in real life, you know. And it's not just theory, is it? Where, tell us about where you've seen this actually work, actually be tried and work. Well, at that point, it's worked in a number of countries. The OECD um, documents over 600 cases of uh, such, uh, you know, deliberative assemblies around the world. They, they range from, you know, small groups of 15 to much larger groups of a few hundreds. But um, so they've been done. We, we don't know enough about what worked and what didn't, to be honest, but many of them led to um, actual policy changes, have influenced legislation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The more famous cases are in um, Ireland. Ireland, very famously at this point, um, managed to 
decriminalize abortion by using um, uh, a, a randomly selected citizens assembly of 99 Irish people who came together for several weekends, concluded that they needed to decriminalize abortion. And that proposal then went to parliament and parliament put it to a referendum. And then two thirds of the population said, yes, it's time. It's time to decriminalize abortion. Um, it worked also on other issues that are you know, morally fraught. It was uh, marriage equality for, for gay people. Uh, in France, it worked on a very, very different topic, which was climate change. So it seemed a lot more technical and, and complicated. Uh, the idea was how do we curb greenhouse gas emissions in France by 40% of the 1990s levels in ways that do not basically trigger another yellow vest movement. Because what had happened in France is that Macron tried to be ecological in some ways, created an eco, um, an eco uh, a carbon tax, and then it triggered like massive rebellion uh, among the, the yellow vests. So that's a very different topic, but it worked as well. It's led to the most ambitious climate law, uh, environmental law that we've, uh, we've ever had in France. So it's worked. So Nazir, does this inspire you to have a go at this in Malaysia or, or what, would, what would stand in the way? Tell us about how that looks from where you're sitting um, in Malaysia. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd like to um, you know, hear about how this idea is you know, sold, uh, if you like, in, in other countries. Uh, and from what I can gather, typically these things, um, you know, the, the kind of major ones like Chile, et cetera, uh, come about after you have a major incident. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in Malaysia, I guess that we don't have one. So it's a little bit more of a challenge to kind of convert, particularly the parliamentarians um, um, to uh, this idea, because some of them are already telling me, say, look, you know, this is our job. Why are you trying to take away our jobs? Uh, so it requires some convincing. Uh, but back to the um, um, discussion on, on composition, uh, Helen, I, 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 if I recall correctly, the, the Irish uh, 2012 uh, actually had two thirds randomly selected and one third parliamentarians, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So, you know, um, you can get this mix and I don't know um, what drives uh, the mix. Uh, is it the complexities of the issues and, and so on? Uh, two is, you know, I, I, I wonder if in the Malaysian situation, uh, a bit more of a balance uh, is uh, would be more suitable, uh, given what we're looking at here is a complete national reset uh, and many, many complicated policy issues uh, within within that uh, may require, um, you know, more, um, I guess, people with more experience uh, and, and intellect to, uh, to grasp some of these issues. So I was thinking of something of a balance between, you know, a kind of a, a random selection, as well as some people who are selected by virtue of their leadership roles or their 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 intellectual um, standing. Right. So these are excellent questions. I'd say that from the evidence that we have, there are you know several models, and the one that seems to have worked the best is indeed the hybrid one. Uh, Islands, the way it worked is that it didn't, they didn't wait for, a, I think, a, a massive rebellion. I don't remember that being a sort of precedent to the decision to resort to citizens' assemblies. But they did get a lot of activism from academics who believed in those ideas, pushed for them, and um, activists who just were on board for a while and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, organized a, a tour of, like, uh, Ireland and talked to local politicians, raised funds to get them tried here and there. And eventually they convinced um, parliament to do this hybrid first citizens assembly that was two third uh, randomly selected citizens, one third politicians. And it worked so well, it created so, so much goodwill and, and trust between these different constituencies that parliament then, when this issue of abortion came on, on, the, you know, uh, on the national stage, felt comfortable and trusting a fully random sample with the recommendation. And don't forget that at no point did Parliament lose control of the process because in the end, they were the ones who were going to decide what to do with the recommendation. So it's not like at any point in time, the randomly selected sample is truly empowered to make the decision, but they're given a real influence, a real voice. The French system, uh, it happened because it's more like the Chilean example. It took a social movement that was so scary 
that really, that it was very scary. November 2018, the government was scared to death. So they played two cards. One was repression. The other was deliberation. They started so-called great national debate that took you know, two months and basically put French politics on pause. And they started experimenting with multiple ways of consulting the people. You had an online platform. You had uh, randomly selected assemblies at the regional level, 20 of them, roughly 21 even, um, including in, in our ultramarine territories. You had open meetings that people could organize themselves. I mean, it was really a just let's see what sticks. And what stuck was really the idea of a national level randomly selected assembly on environmental issues. That's how it worked. But at the end of the day, we, critics will tell you, well, did it really work? Because in the end, you know, again, everything was filtered through the parliamentary uh, and, uh, you know, system and, and the ministries and, and the presidential will. So it's not as ambitious. The result is not as ambitious as, as, as what the citizens had proposed. So, you know, you, you, in the end, it's always hybrid. It's always hybrid. Um, I think it's more pacific and, and, and more successful in the Irish case because from the beginning, there was a collaboration between politicians and, and randomly selected citizens. That said, I have to nuance that by saying that the CESE, our third legislative assembly in France, is trying to get representatives of civil society um, to work with randomly selected citizens They've done three experiments so far, and it's not working very well. It's really hard to combine the logic of election or appointment and the logic of random selection. The, it doesn't always gel. It gelled in the case of, um, of the Irish First Assembly, but what I've seen so far is that in other types of mixes, it doesn't work. And lots of the questions online, and thank you, those of you online, for sending in such great questions. And lots of the questions are about this exact question of representativeness. Um, so uh, Bassan Anconé Ras asks, you know, in an era where intersectionality means that almost every combination of identity traits produces its own unique um, outcome, how on earth do we get representation um, in this sample? Daniel Scharf asks, is there a minimum age? Does it depend on the subject matter? How does it go? Others, um, Marietta asks, what about the economically vulnerable, etc.? What's interesting about those first, the first two questions about representation is they're assuming that the random selection has to some, in some way be representative, but that's not true in a jury. Yeah, it's not true in a jury because it's too small for mm -hmm. sure. But I mean, so, you know, I like the Greek model best in a way because it's completely blind. It was really one person, one token. It's not like, oh, we're gonna do a stratified random sampling using categories like, I don't know, uh, well, economic status or education level or, because that already is a form of essentialization of people that I don't love. I think it's kind of an unavoidable given the constraints, given the world we live in. But ideally, you don't have to define ahead of time who you want in your sample because we can't deal with two large samples and, and we have to do this stratified random sampling anyway. So then the question becomes, well, what criteria do you choose? And sometimes the nature of the question matters. So I think gender will, will always be an essential criterion, for example. Uh, age two, probably, education level, probably. But ethnicity and race, for example, it's not possible in the French context because it's illegal. Religion is illegal too. It's not, a, it's not something you can ask people to divulge. So you cannot, you know, make quotas for those people. Um, in, a, in other contexts, maybe it's legitimate to have those categories. Um, in the French context, one category, that one criterion that could have been used was your views on climate change to make sure we have the same number of climato-skeptic people in the sample as you have in the larger population. They didn't go for it though. And as a result, and I think that's a design flaw, the sample was overly um, in favor of, you know, dealing with climate change was, was really convinced that climate change was happening. So it was not quite representative of the French population at large. I mean, you know, this was a, one, one of the discrepancies. Mm. Is there a question from the room? Yes. Do introduce yourself. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Federico and I'm from El Salvador, where our democracy is not resetting, it is disrupting. We have a millennial Twitter president 
uh, who's 38 years old, uh, that has over 92% of approval ratings. And uh, with his super majority in Congress, he has found loopholes in our constitution to appoint a completely new Supreme Court, a new constitutional court, who recently um, issued a decree that re-election, albeit prohibited by constitutional uh, uh, standards, it is a human right, is the claim, to, to seek re-election. And once again, with a backing of 92% of, of popularity, you know, like what is left in the toolbox of the, the, the minimum opposition that stands that wants to ensure that the institutionality of the, of the country continues and that there are fair rules of the game uh, for, um, for more participants in, in safeguarding democracy, even though the president claims that this is a new model of governance and it is backed by the will and uh, the this percentage of the people. But thank you. And, and actually, I think where you're getting to with the question is something that David Farnsworth asked, which is how do we get from there to here, right? How do we, how do we transition? The story Federico tells us of El Salvador repeats in so many countries where term limits and institutions are being eroded. So any thoughts? I'd be interested from, to hear from both Nadir and Hélène on this question of where do you begin to reset? Uh, not like that, I guess. I don't think Salvador is a, is a good example. Um, it's, it's, again, this belief that, uh, you know, um, savior is going to come along and, and reset democracy for us without really including us in the choices then that, are, that are made later on. Um, I, so I don't believe in that model. Um, I, it's a really difficult question, the question from here to there. I think you need a combination of social movements pushing for changes, uh, well-intentioned visionary leaders at the top from within the existing system willing to, you know, put their own political career at risk by saying, look, it's true, we're not doing a good job as a group because we're selected in ways that are too oligarchic. And if you look at the American Congress, it's the embodiment of that sort of elitism. So let's change, let's change the system. And maybe we don't have to do it overnight, but we can start by creating a house of the people that is randomly selected. And we sort of like, you know, um, devolve some of the power of Congress to that new chamber. For example, there's a debate in the US about whether uh, Congress people should be allowed to um, trade stocks, you know, because they consistently do 12% better than the stock market. You know, there's, there's a huge issue there. Somehow they have to self-regulate and make the decisions about their own salaries and the things they're allowed to do. And that's a problem. You could delegate that task of legislating about that to a popular jury of sort, a house of the people mm -hmm. that would be a lot more non-biased and, and, and disinterested, I think, and than, than the current system. So, and then you can figure out where there's a division of labor that can occur that ultimately reinforces the overall system, even at, at, as it potentially disempowers elected officials to, to an extent. Because I don't believe that you can just graft on the system another chamber while keeping things as they are. There, there will have to be trade-offs and, and um, devo devolution of power. And, and uh, Max Emmett asks, how do we strengthen the incentives for politicians to accept this? Um, Na Nazir, you're, you're nodding. Um, what, what do yeah, you I think? Mean, this is precisely where I am, because at the moment, this is an idea that you know, we have put forward. Uh, but it's just the, the, the kind of thinking behind this concept, and we hope that it appeals to the institutions, be it the rulers, uh, the monarchy, be it parliament, be it the politicians. Uh, but, you know, and we're giving that time, um, but then we're asking ourselves the question, do you really think they're going to come around? Or do we have to convert ourselves into a social movement and, you know, kind of garner support from uh, other um, NGOs, etc. Uh, and then we ask ourselves the question, what do politicians and, and, and institutions really listen to? Well, they listen to numbers. So should we go out and do our own referendum of the Malaysians and sort of say, okay, how many of you agree uh, that, you know, the system is dysfunctional and we need deliberative uh, democracy? 
Uh, and then if you can get serious numbers behind the idea, then uh, you know the politicians may not have a choice but support you. The other alternative is to really sell this idea to some political parties uh, who would uh, hopefully then build it into their manifestos going into an election. Uh, so if they win the election, they're somewhat committed uh, to setting up uh, these uh, deliberative platforms. So that's actually very interesting because that's exactly uh, the thought process that we're going through at the moment. So let's take more ideas from the room. Um, yes. Hi, I'm Melissa Lockett. I'm from the US. I'm doing a master's in public policy here. So I'm curious, a lot of the conversations we're talking about are the strength of institutions and maybe, you know, the elite and power capture. But a lot of the changes, like in the US, for example, require those elites to actually codify or enact them. And so how do you realistically think that we reset democracy if we're looking for the elites to, to do that themselves. I, I don't see how you do that without some major power shift, or frankly, I don't see how you do it in a peaceful manner. I would love to be told otherwise, I'm just curious. So Elaine, you said before visionary leaders in a strong civil society, is there another bit? That... Um, well, again, the, the, the case of France is interesting because I never thought I would see it there, um, given, you know, we have a, a fifth republic, which is extremely, I mean, the, the spirit is quite monarchist, you know, like we have a, it's, it's based around that, that super powerful president, the, the parliament doesn't have many powers, but somehow and it did take, you know, someone willing to try it. So President Macron deserves some credit for, you know, trying these new forms of de deliberative and, and participatory democracy. But that said, it would, it would have never happened without the pressure of social movements. So I'm not saying violence is the answer, absolutely not, but some amount of pressure, you know, uh, demonstrations, uh, strikes, uh, uh, giving the power that be a sense that things are not right and people are fed up and that some things need to change. I think that worked. Uh, in that particular case, but it needs to be accompanied by solutions. That's the other thing, because the Yildiz movements were all against, but not for many things. And then over the time, over time, an alliance developed with academics, with um, activists who had ideas, and they came up with this platform of first um, um, a citizen-initiated referendum. That's actually what the Yildiz wanted more than anything, more than the citizens' assembly, and an agenda of citizens' assemblies pushed by various activists. We had um, an artist in uh, Cyril Dion, who's a documentary maker, so civil society, you know, people from all walks of life, but artists, uh, people with followers on Twitter, spreading awareness, and it works. That's another venue for, for change, I think. And it goes faster than, than you'd think. Uh, Nazir mentioned a referendum. Is that, isn't that problematic? Isn't a referendum rather like Twitter. I mean, it, it elicits a gut instinct reaction from people, which is the opposite to the kind of get people deliberating and taking responsibility for their decisions. So what I mean, what's your what's your response to Nazir? Should he have a referendum on well, this? Innovation? Again, it, it depends who is initiating it, who's, you know, putting the question to the public. So if it's government, it's worrisome to some degree, because they're going to, you know, frame it in such a way that it plays in their favor. That, at least in France, that's always how things have been playing out. So we're very wary of referenda. But in Switzerland, that's a completely alternative model where referenda are conducted like, you know, all the time on a monthly basis. And people are really used to, to them. And, and you can trigger them through so-called citizen initiatives. So if a large enough number of signatories have an idea and they want it to be, you know, put to the larger public, then that's how it works. To me, that more horizontal use of the referendum, in, also in a culture in a country that's already very deliberative, is actually quite good. The question is, it's not easy to import the practices of Switzerland to, you know, countries like France or, or perhaps Malaysia, where it's not the it's not the culture. We don't have a culture of referendum that's truly democratic. So I, I'm also not sure. Difficult. Other other comments, questions? Yes. Hi, I'm from Afghanistan and currently studying public policy at Lavnik School of Government. So my question is, as you may know, that a couple of months ago, the government of Afghanistan was overturned by Taliban. So, and how you define, um, so we chose someone who was representing us, but then our leaders, our leaders failed. And now the country is in a catastrophe. 
So how you define a uh, reasoning democracy in the states and such fragile states where people are fighting for the for their rights? Uh, for example, Afghanistan, for example, Myanmar, where the regime was overturned by the military coup. And now people are fighting, but still it depends. The context of each country depend, uh, depends on culture, tradition, or the te uh, on the territory, the neighboring countries. So do you have a specific um, form of resetting a democracy, especially and developing or the fragile states, whether how it, it may work? Because Afghanistan has experienced a lot of regimes and a lot of invasions, Russia, Britain, like US, all of them failed. And, and can I just add in uh, Dr. Osaretin Okunbo um, asks, you know, it, the re, he mentions the recent coup d'etat in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Chad, in Guinea, and the fragility of democracies um, in that part of Africa. Um, in what ways can we can a, the risk of a coup be averted? So in these these more it, settings in which democracy is being tested at its extreme and government itself is fragile. Does your, I, does, do your ideas about democracy have any relevance, do you think? Uh, it, it's really hard, that's definitely, uh, my examples are all taken from, you know, uh, Western countries that are stable, um, have like functioning bureaucracies, highly educated populations. That said, I think, um, in order to prepare for a true democratic change in these countries, I think you have to start at the root, which are, you know, the families, the local associations, the schools, and the random selection principle, you can use it there to select class representatives, to select uh, council members, and slowly, you know, council by council, socialize the population to equality. Which, which is what you get with random selection. And, and in particular, I'm thinking of women. As long as women are not empowered in the house, in, in the villages, in a, in a way that, that allows a true dialogue and, and across ages, across genders, across um, religions. I mean, if you had the, the sort of uh, ethnic tensions as well and, and religious tensions, then, then when, when sh political change comes, nothing changes because these old habits of um, unequal treatment and domination kick in again, and you get another strong man who had the best intentions, but somehow is only surrounding himself with the same members of the same tribes. And so I think that there's also almost no point in going for the big picture revolution and the big change at the top if you don't already prepare the the foundations. Um, and I and I think that. You know, um, in, 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 in the US, the jury is such a foundation. Um, the town hall meetings were such a foundation. In Switzerland, definitely, uh, the reason why it's been, you know, a very successful democracy that, that does bridge cultures and languages when the rest of Europe was, you know, uh, covered in blood with religion, religious wars is because at the town level, they were constantly talking across groups and, and so I think that that's like the only recommendation I can decently make. This is an incredibly complicated mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and in other for so Nick Gill says in the UK, um, you know, maybe this is the, what we should do with the House of Lords, turn it into a citizen's house of review of randomly selected citizens. So take an institution everyone agrees needs some kind of reform and use that. Is there such an institution in Malaysia, Nazir, that would be a natural home for the citizens' assembly? Um, no, not at this point. I mean, we have a Senate. Um, I suppose the Senate um, is uh, a rubber stamp uh, Senate, more or less now. So maybe maybe they could be converted uh, into a, uh, an assembly uh, as well. Uh, but I think you know it's probably easier not to touch the institutions and just create a new one uh, and so that you're not seen to be hostile to, uh, to anyone else. Uh, but on the earlier uh, question, Gary, I just want to say that, you know, the Malaysian experience uh, shows that, you know, digital democracy is a means of getting out uh, of a crisis uh, where, you know, in 1970, you know, we had complete breakdown uh, and, uh, you know, a dictatorship uh, and to get out of it, uh, we resorted to a deliberative platform. 
And similarly now, I think what our idea uh, now is that we should create the platform so that we engage, uh, we collaborate, we come up with solutions at a time when uh, we worry that, you know, at this trajectory, uh, we might have a crisis again. So if, if it can be the route out of a crisis, does that mean it could be a solution to uh, in Afghanistan or in Burkina Faso or in countries which are currently in crisis? where there is both a government and a people that desperately need something to work, would, would you say that that's, that's a road I, I forward? Think, yeah, I certainly would. And I think, you know, even, you know, if you look at uh, uh, kind of the Communist Party in China, they have essentially deliberative platforms as a means of engaging the citizens at large, right? Right. Next question. Yes. Hi. Uh... I'm Fadli from Malaysia. I'm studying uh, MPP right now in BSG. Uh, I just want to ask uh, Tansui Nazir. Um, first, Better Malaysia Assembly is a noble idea that we need, but how will Better Malaysia Assembly establish its legitimacy um, uh, in its efforts? And does the endorsement from the monarchy is enough to establish that legitimacy? And what would be the immediate milestones uh, uh, next for BMA uh, in terms of carrying these efforts. Thank you. Uh, Gary, I'm glad there's another uh, Malaysian at uh, BSG this year. Um, <laughs> so uh, thanks, Fadli. And, um, you know, the, the short answer is that um, we have written to the monarchy and all we're asking for is endorsement and recommendation. We believe that the BMA can only uh, be set up by the executive and parliament. And we think that we want a, a, a real national effort where all the institutions come together and believe that this is the way forward. So parliament, government continue to do what you are meant to be doing. In the meanwhile, for the next two years, let this group of citizens uh, deliberate a better way forward uh, uh, for the nation. And I think, you know, with the support of parliament, monarchy and um, government, uh, you would naturally have the legitimacy. Helen, is there any other way to get legitimacy for such a forum? Roy, Roy Dark asks, you know, it's just comments that deliberative assemblies will require redefining legitimacy. Yes, Nazia's idea is to get all the existing institutions to support it. But what, what other sources of legitimacy? Well, I, I think we have to also consider that you can create legitimacy um, by by delivering by showing that you're you know successful at what you're doing so that that's what happened to the the french citizens convention for climate its legitimacy initially was quite tenuous it was the product of the will of the prince macron you know said there will be a convention and there was a convention and initially suspicion and distrust and skepticism was the, was like the reaction in france and in fact ignorance because most people didn't know about it but then because the citizens who came appropriated the object, uh, felt empowered, decided to uh, evangelize for this convention. They went back to the regions of origin, organized meetings. They started tweeting. They started going on Instagram, all the social media, made the governance structure of this assembly very nervous, actually, because they, they initially wanted to keep it a little under control. But it, it, it gained a life of its own. And its legitimacy, I think, by the end was real and quite independent from the fact that it had been created by the president. So, so I, th I think that's how, we, you know, when you start something, you're not sure it's going to work, but you have to, you have to take a, a chance, right, on, a, on, a, on these kind of new political actors. And, and I also wanted to mention, because this is really a question that I find very difficult about uh, fragile states and places where democracy is, is non-existent or, or really very fragile. I'm thinking also of the experiment in Rojava, uh, in, in Syria, you know, uh, where the, the Kurds have, have created this, um, this form of direct democracy. It's not based on random selection at all, but it really brings together women and people from all religion and ethnicities together in a very successful way, given the extremely dire circumstances, the threat of war and violence that they're under. Um, and I actually, I don't know is, is as of today, you know, they, they've been completely repressed or not, but for a while they showed a way, even in places that are, you know, um, very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and I want, want to say more generally, it's not just about randomly selected 
you know, assemblies. I think in Taiwan, there's also a great way that um, you can organize participation and deliberation in, an, in a community online through innov innovative digital technologies. So Audrey Tang is the, the Minister of um, Digital Technologies there. She's done amazing things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of the opposite extreme of the Rojava experiment, if you want, because it's, it's tech top and, and really like online and it's for an educated population in a, in a state that functions. And, but um, we have to be creative, we have to be open-minded and, and, um, and I think we have to trust that new forms of democracy are gonna be born, not because they're dictated by a political theorist or, or you know, imposed by well-meaning politician or it's, it, there's, a, there's a life also of, of um, associations and movements that, that will make those things emerge. I, I, trust in, I trust the process, if you will. I mean, uh, I think of legitimacy quite crudely as either, you know, input legitimacy, the government is legitimate because people have voted for them mm -hmm. and they make rules within, they make laws within the rules of the system, but they're legitimate because we voted for them versus the legitimacy of our judicial system, which, re which rests on the reasoning that judges give for their decisions. Mm -hmm. Where does a deliberative assembly fit? Do they have to give reasons for their decisions? Is that why people accept their legitimacy? Or is it because they are representative of the people? Or does the randomness of their selection give them, like, well, tell me where it fits within that. So, so I tend to view leg legitimacy as a, as a mix of all these factors, right? It's both who's part of the process, what the process is like, and what the outputs are likely to be. I think all three things usually, you know, increase the, the legitimacy of an institution or an authority. And in the case of, um, of deliberative assemblies that are based on random selection, uh, it's definitely the, the throughput uh, legitimacy that matters, meaning that they are deliberative. It's not a place where people just grandstand and posture and try to score points. It's truly a place where they think through difficult issues and they come up with reasons and they're capable of giving an account of why they're going for such and such solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely a, a huge part. Um, the output legitimacy is still very weak because they haven't done that much, right? Uh, again, because they haven't been properly empowered, they haven't been properly institutionalized. But it's starting in Belgium, East, um, East, East Belgium, they've empowered a, a small council of 27 randomly selected citizens to set the agenda. So as we do more of this, the output legitimacy, I, I think, will grow. And the input legitimacy, I guess, um, it's not who, it's not that the public actually voted for them, obviously, but if there is consent and consensus around the idea of random selection, you could have, I guess, input legitimacy that way. Mm -hmm. um, and there's this additional legitimacy that I don't know what to call, but it's just the fact that we all get an equal chance of being part of, of these um, bodies. It's democraticity is actually, another source of legitimacy. And Lazier, in Malaysia, are there local traditional forms of decision-making that this could build from other than the, um, you know, the National Deliberative Council that you cite? Are there any other forms of decision-making that take place in local communities? Um, I think there have been um, in, you know, sort of in, in villages, they've, they've had, um, you know, various uh, setups, a bit like in, in India uh, as well, where, you know, villages actually come together in very, in a very Greek way um, to deliberate. Um, but, you know, those are, I guess, small in, in, in settings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me take one last question from the, from the audience here. Yes, do introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Keisuke, um, and I'm a visiting student. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, you know, especially in the U.S., I, I guess, um, there's this huge environment of misinformation um, where people don't even seem to be able to agree on simple problems like climate change exists. Um, so I guess I'm just wondering whether there's optimism. I mean, why, why do you have so much optimism in this random selection when so many swaths of people can't even agree um, because it just seems like that ship maybe has sailed in certain countries. Ah, so is it too late? Um, well, I don't think you can 
think that it's too late. We have to do something. That's one thing. But the other is that I think the, the sort of polarizing environment um, is a result of a badly designed democracy rather than a cause, or at least it's equally both. And so if we change the system and if we make the system more truly democratic, I think the media ecology will change. Uh, it might require, though, something even more radical than what we've been talking about so far. And the question of from here to there is even more difficult, which is democratizing firms, corporations, the media, meaning changing the selection method for staffing boards of directors. Because if you do that, the implications are enormous. You know, you empower workers, you empower Facebook workers, the engineers at Google, the consumers, potentially, you could have a, you know, a, uh, representatives of those stakeholders as well. At that point, I think you would have an ecology of media that would be very different, that wouldn't be necessarily um, trying to maximize clicks and mine, mine, trying to mine our data and trying to, you know, this would be a different world. It's hard to model because there are too many unknown, but I think we are at a point where the crisis is so deep and has been running for so long that if we're not bold, nothing will change. And the experiments of Fishkin and others in America have shown that once you get people in the same room together deliberating, the extremes actually mitigate. People start changing their view of why the other has the same, has, has such a different view, etc. So some evidence. Tansri Nazir Razak, let me turn to you for a final word. Yeah, thank you, Gary and, 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 and Helen, and thank you for uh, this marvelous session. I mean, I think, you know, um, I'm, I'm deep into uh, this, this, this project and fairly in, and determined uh, that we see the light of day. I'm very confident that one day Malaysia will have this better Mas Malaysia Assembly. I just hope uh, it will be sooner uh, rather than too late. Uh, because, you know, uh, I think this is really uh, the right way uh, for us to um, bring our problems onto the table and, and, and discuss and come up with um, solutions which I don't think uh, politicians can uh, arrive at. Uh, I think in terms of uh, Helen and I, where we have maybe uh, not full convergence is in terms of participation uh, in the assembly itself. You know, I'm more focused on the deliberation and the recommendations that come out in the assembly uh, rather than um, you know, the purity of the participation uh, in the uh, assembly, I would certainly go uh, for a hybrid uh, of some sort. I, as I say publicly here, I think what we need to see in the assembly are, uh, is the good, the great and the ordinary uh, coming together uh, and, and arriving at good solutions for a better Malaysia. Helen, a last word. How, how far can you go on that without it looking like just PR? We've invited you along, you know, as the ordinary to put a, a stamp of legitimacy on our our decisions. What did you call it? The deliberation washing? Uh, participation, participation washing. Well, so, you know, you have to pre-commit. If, if politicians want to do that, they have to pre-commit and then keep their promises. So, you know, uh, famously, President Macron said at the beginning, I will take your propos proposals and submit them without filtering to you know referendum or parliament or parliament or and at the end there was a lot of filtering going on and that created a lot of anger and pushback and dis disillusionment so i think that you have to think really hard about what you're willing to do and and risk and uh and then stick to it and trust the process this is very hard for politicians because they want to be in control and know exactly what they're going to get that's why, you know, referenda often, they're, they're just a show. They already know what the outcome is going to be. And when the outcome is not what they expect, like Brexit, everybody's, you know, losing it. But I think you have to trust the process. If, you, if you're truly a committed Democrat, you have to believe that citizens are capable of making the right decision, even if you think it's, if it's, if it's against your, your, your judgment. And when you look at the 600 experimentations as a scholar, does that give you confidence that that starting presumption is right? That put citizens into a well-designed deliberative forum and they will come up with a sensible outcome? Yes, it does. It's, it's, it's not the only thing that gives me hope, actually. I think, uh, you know, historical evidence, um, theory, and recent practice all converge toward this 
fundamental democratic intuition that we're all equal and all capable of contributing to the definition of the common good. And it's, it always strikes me how hard it is for, for people to come to that conclusion when in fact it's supposed to be a premise of the system we're, we're in, right? It's hard to trust each other, bizarrely. It's hard to trust ourselves. But that's what we're supposed to do if we're true Democrats. Well, thank you. Um, Professor Hélène Landemore, Professor of Political Theory, whose, whose doctorate was about David Hume and who has been, you know, bringing her thinking right through to the cutting edge of the 21st century ever since. And to Tansri Nazir Razak, who's been wrestling with and tackling um, how to strengthen Malaysia, um, spent a year really thinking about it comparatively here at Oxford University and is now practically implementing different kinds of solutions. Can you all join me in thanking two fantastic panelists for a great discussion today? Thank you.